introduction. This translation is substantive translation because it is complete as to substance. Nothing has been omitted except the more wearisome of very numerous repetitions, which are such a striking feature of the original. The Pali scriptures here translated are from the Triple Basket, Tripitaka, a collection of the Buddha's teaching regarded as canonical by Theravada school of Buddhism, which is found today in Sri Lanka, Burma and Thailand, and was until recently equally strong in Laos and Cambodia. It is now also well established in Britain and other Western countries. The claim of this school is to have preserved the original teaching of the Buddha and there are good grounds for at least considering that the doctrine as found in the Pali scriptures come as close as we can get to what the Buddha actually taught. In any case, the Pali Tripitaka is the only canon of an elderly school that is preserved complete. It is not, however, in the true spirit of Buddhism to adopt a fundamentalist attitude towards the scriptures and it is thus open to the reader, Buddhist as well as non-Buddhist, to regard the text here translated with an open and critical mind. The Life of the Buddha Siddhartha Gautama, in Sanskrit Siddhartha Gautama, who became the Buddha, the Enlightened One, may have lived from about 560 to 483 BC, to many modern scholars suggest a latter deity. Oriental traditions of a, a number of alternative datings that favoured in Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia being 623 to 543. It was on this basis that the 2500th anniversary of his passing into final Nibbana was celebrated as Buddha Jayanti in the East in 1956 to 57. He belonged to the Sakya clan dwelling on the edge of the Himalayas, his actual birthplace being a few miles north of the present-day Indian border in Nepal. His father, Suddhodana, was in fact an elected chief of the clan rather than the king he was later made out to be. Though his title was Raja, a term which only partly corresponds to our word king, some of the states of India at that time were kingdoms and others republics, and the Sarkin Republic was subject to the powerful king of neighboring Kosala, which lay to the south. Disentangling the probable facts from the mass of legends surrounding Gautama's life, we may assume the following to be approximately correct. The brought up to a life of luxury, the young prince was overcome by a sense of essentially sorrowful aspect of life and he decided to seek the cause and cure of the state which he termed Dukkha, conventionally but inadequately rendered suffering in English. At the age of 29, he renounced the world, going forth from the household life into homelessness, in accordance with an already well-established tradition, thus joining the ranks of the wandering ascetics, Samanas. He went successively to two teachers, Alarakhalama and Uddhaka Ramaputta, who taught him how to attain to high meditative states. Realizing, however, that even the attainment of these states didn't solve his problem, Gautama went off his own and practiced severe austerities for six years, gathering a little group of five ascetics around him. However, finding that even the most extreme form of asceticism likewise did not lead to the goal, he abandoned these excesses and sat down at the foot of a tree by the river Naranjana, at the place now known as Bodhkaya, determined not to rise from the spot until enlightenment should dawn. During that night he passed beyond the meditative stages he had previously reached and attained to complete liberation as Buddha, the enlightened or awakened one. He spent the remaining 45 years of his life wandering up and down the Ganges Valley, expounding the doctrine that he had found and establishing the Sangha or order of Buddhist monks and nuns, which still exist today. Historical and philosophical background to the Buddha's time Ascetics and Brahmins India in the Buddha's day did not yet suffer from the grinding poverty of the present time. The modern caste system had not fully developed 
but we find its germ in the division of society into four groups or colors Pali, Vanna. The designation betrays the origin of the distinction being based on the conquest of northern India in about 1600 BC by the comparatively light skinned Aryans who looked down on those of darker hue they found here. In the context of Buddhism, where this racial and aristocratic term literally noble is applied to the nobility of the spirit, we shall use from Arvin based on Pali. The Brahmins were the guardians of the religious cult brought into India by the Arvins. In later, non Buddhist sources we always hear of the Brahmins as taking the leading place in society. Buddhist sources, however, assert the supremacy of the Khatiyas. Sanskrit Kshatriya, the noble or warrior's class to which Gautama belonged. It appears that while further west the Brahmins had already established their supremacy, this was not yet the case in the Ganges Valley. In the third place came the Vaisas or merchants and finally the Sudhas, Sanskrit Shudra or workers. Below this there were certainly some slaves. We even hear of a Sudha having a slave and some unfortunates of class who were later to become known as untouchables. But in addition to these groupings, there were a considerable number of people, including at least few women, who had adapted out of conventional society. In the text, we frequently meet with the compound Samana Brahmana, which we render ascetics and Brahmins, while the part text society dictionary correctly states that this compound expression denotes quite generally leaders in religious life. It is also true that the two groups were usually reversed. The religious situation in the northern India around 500 BC is very interesting and was undoubtedly exceptionally favorable to the development of the Buddhists and the other faiths. Though the Brahmins formed an important and increasingly powerful hereditary priesthood, they were never like their counterparts elsewhere able to assert their undisputed authority by persecuting and perhaps exterminating other religious groups. It seems that some Brahmins would not have been averse to such a cause, but it was not open to them. They were cast set aside from the other men in reading about them in the Buddhist text. One is insistently reminded of the New Testament of the Pharisees, though in both cases the picture presented is, to say the least, one-sided. They along were learned in three Vedas, knew the mystic mantras and could conduct all the important bloodly and expensive sacrifices. In fact, not all Brahmins exercised their priestly functions. Some had settled down to agriculture or even trade while continuing to expect the differences which they regarded as their due. The earlier Dravidian inhabitants who had been overrun by the Aryans were the creators of the Indus Valley civilization, were the great cities of Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, all now in Pakistan. And it is to this civilization that we must look for the origins of the second stream of the religious life, that of Samanas, Sanskrit Samanas. These have sometimes been absurdly called recluses, where the term really means the very opposite. True, a summoner might occasionally be a recluse, a hermit, shut away from the world in a rocky cell, but the more usual type was a wanderer who had indeed abandoned the world to learn more or less ascetic life. He or rarely she was in fact, to use a modern expression, a dropout from society, though differing from our modern dropouts in the least one important respect. The summoners as a group received no less respect from all classes even kings, then did the Brahmin. Their teachings were many and varied, some wise and some exceedingly foolish, some lofty spiritual and some crudely materialistic. The point is that they were completely free to teach whatever they pleased, and so far from being persecuted as they might have been elsewhere, were received with honor wherever they went. We can distinguish several different groups of these people. There were in particular the self mortifiers on the one hand and the wanderers on the other, whose only austerity probably consisted in their detachment from family ties and, in theory at least, their observance of chastity.
Many of the bizarre and often revolting practices of the first group are detailed in Sutta 8 verses 14. As pointed out in a note to the Sutta, the practice of extreme austerity, tapa should not be called penance because of the motivation is entirely different from that of a Christian penitent, to whom such people might be superficially compared. The word tapas, which basically means heat, is used both for austere practices indulged in and for the result they are intended to achieve, which is power, that is, the development of various paranormal powers. The belief was that these could be achieved by means of such practices and, in particular, by sexual restraint. Thus, so far from practicing austerity like the Christian penitent, to atone for past sins, they undertook these practices in the hope of future powers, including, perhaps, those very joys that had been temporarily renounced. The wondrous Paribrajakas, some of whom were Brahmins, wore clothes, unlike many of others who went completely naked, and they led a less comfortable life. They were philosophers who propounded many different theories about the world and nature and delighted in disputation. The Pali Canon introduces us to six well-known teachers of time, all of whom were older than Gautama. They were Purana Kassapa, an amoralist, Makari Gozala, a determinist, Aditakesa Kambali, a materialist, Pakudakachayana, a categorialist, the Nigantanatha Futta, the Jain leader known to us as Mahavira, who was a relativist and ecletic, and Sanjay Bellata Futta, an agonistic, skeptic or positivist. Their different views are quoted by King Adasatta in Sutta 2 verses 16 to 32. Besides these, there were the profounders of the originally secret teaching incorporated in the Upanishads which came to be grafted into the orthodox Brahmanism and whose doctrines were later to form the core of the Vedanta system. For them, the impersonal Brahman is the supreme reality and the goal of the teaching is the realization that the individual human soul or self, Atman, is ultimately identical with the universal self, Atman, which is another term for Brahman these Upanishads are not mentioned in the Pali Canon, though it is almost, but not perhaps quite, certain that the, that the Gautama was acquainted with their teachings. It has been urged that at depth there is no contradiction between the greatest insights of the Upanishads and the Buddha's teaching, a view that would be contested by many. We shall return very briefly to this point later. Sufficient is to say, here that any theory that the Buddha taught, a doctrine of a supreme self, can only be said to fly in the face of the evidence. Nor is it true, as it's sometimes said, that in ancient India everybody believed in karma, the law of moral cause and effect, and rebirth, or indeed in anything else. There were, as we have seen, materialists, skeptics, equocrators, and all sort of fantastic theorists. Neither can we accept the statement that the Buddha was a Hindu who sought to reform the ancient religion. Apart from anachronistic use of the term Hindu, this is wrong because he rejected the claims of the Brahmin as religious authorities and, while not totally denying the existence of their gods assigned to these fundamentally unimportant role of the scheme of things. In so far as he belonged to any existing tradition, it was that the Samanas, and like them he taught as he saw fit. As a teacher he was not beholden to anyone. He agreed or disagreed with tradition or views of others entirely in accordance with his sovereign perception of the truth. It is however correct to say that the situation in India in his time was particularly favorable to the spread of his teaching, while the teacher's long life enabled this to become firmly established in his lifetime and under his direction. Main Points of the Teaching 
The main points of the Buddha's teaching need only be briefly summarized here. In his first sermon, Samyutta Nikaya 56.11, the Buddha taught that there were two extremes to be avoided, overindulgence in sensuality on the one hand and self-torture on the other. He had had personal experience of both. Buddhism is thus the middle way between these extremes and also between some other pairs of opposites, such as eternalism and annihilationism. The Four Noble Truths The most Sakyan formulation of the teaching is in the form of the Four Noble Truths. Suffering, Dukkha, the origin of suffering, Dukkha Samudaya, which is craving, Tanha, the cessation of suffering, Dukkha Nirodha, the path leading to the cessation of suffering, Dukkha Nirodha Gamani Patipada, which is the Noble Eightfold Path, Arya Atangika Magga, this consists of right view, samaditti, right thought, samasankappa, right speech, samavacha, right action, samakamanta, right livelihood, samajiva, right effort, samavayama, right mindfulness, samasati, right concentration, samasamadhi. The eight steps can be subsumed under three heads of morality sila. Concentration, Samadhi and Wisdom, Panna. It will be noticed that in this arrangement the order is different. This is because while some preliminary wisdom is needed to start on the path, the final flowering of the higher wisdom follows after development of morality and concentration. Stages on the path. Progress on the path leading to the cessation of suffering and hence to Nibbana is described in many places, notably in Sutta too. In a long passage which is repeated verbatim in the following suttas, the most fundamental meditative exercise is set forth in Sutta 22. The breakthrough to the transcendental is achieved in four stages, each of which is subdivided into two, Path, Magga and Frisian, Pala. By attaining the first of these stages, one ceases to be a mere worldling, Prutagjana, and becomes a noble person, Aryapuggala. The stages of path moments are designated in terms of successive breaking of ten fetters. Standard descriptions of these stages are given at many places. At the first stage, one enters the stream and thus becomes stream winner, Sotapanna by experience also referred to as the opening of the Dhamma eye. The first path moment is immediately followed by the fusion Pala and likewise with the other three paths. At the first path, one is said to have glimpsed Nibbana and thereby three of five lower fetters are discarded forever. One, personal to belief, Sakkaya Ditti, that is belief in a self. 2. Doubt, which kicha, and 3. Attachment to rises and rituals, sila paramasa. In other words, having had a glimpse of reality and perceived the falsity of the self-belief, one is unshakable and no more dependent on external aids. One who has gained this state can, it is said, no longer be born in status of woe and is assured of attaining Nibbana after, at the most, seven more lives. At the second stage, one becomes a one's returner, Sakadagami, in whom the fourth and fifth lower fetters are greatly weakened. Four, sensual desire, Kamaraga, and five, ill will, Vyapada. Such a person will attain to Nibbana after, at most, one further human rebirth. It is interesting to note that sensuality and ill will are so powerful that they persist in however attenuated a form for so long. At the third stage, one becomes a non-returner, anagami, in whom the fourth and fifth fetters are completely destroyed. In such a person, all attachments to this world have ceased 
and at death one will be reborn in a higher world in one of the pure abodes and will attain nibbana from there without returning to this world it may be mentioned that in samyutta nikaya 2289 the venerable kemaka actually gives some account of what it feels like to be a non returner finally at the fourth stage one becomes an arahant sanskrit arahat literally worthy one by the destruction of the five higher fetters craving for existence in the form world ruparaga craving for existence in the formless world aruparaga conceit mana restlessness udacha ignorance avijja for such a one the task has been completed and that person will attain final nibbana without remainder at death it should perhaps be added that there are two different ideas that are widely circulated in the east one is that in this denigrate age it is not possible to be an arahant the other less pessimistic view is that while lay person can attain to the first three paths only monks can become arahants There is no scriptural authority for either idea. It should also be mentioned that the Arahant ideal is one that is perfectly valid for all school of Buddhism. Likewise, the concept of the Bodhisattva, who renounces the enjoyment of Nirvana in order to bring all beings to enlightenment, which is considered the hallmark of Mahayana school as opposed to the Hinayana. in fact exist in theravada buddhism as well the difference of school is one of the emphasis and doesn't constitute the unbridgeable gap imagined by some chiefly in the west but it cannot be our task to enter further into these matters here nibbana or nirvana the sanskrit form is better known in the west than the pali nibbana there are not surprisingly many misapprehensions about this In fact it has been said by a witty scholar that all we have to go on is our misconception of nirvana because until we have realized it we cannot know it as it really is but if we cannot say much about what it is we can at least say something about what it is not robert cecil childers in his famous and still useful far dictionary devoted a whole long article in fact a short treatise to provide to his own satisfaction that nibbana implies total extinction and this view though certainly erroneous is still to be met with among some western scholars and yet it would be odd indeed if buddhists were supposed to have to tread the entire path right up to the attainment of arahantship merely in order to finish up with the total liberation which the materialists and many ordinary people today assume to occur for all of us good bad and indifferent at the end of our present life it is true some color is given to this idea by the etymology of the term nirvana blowing out as of a lamp contrasted with this however we find are the very different descriptions of nibbana the in ambatta sutta it is used for the highest happiness defined as the indulgence in the pleasure of five senses obviously a non buddhist use of the word though it is not otherwise attested in pre buddhist sources we thus find two apparently contradictory meanings of nibbana one extinction to highest bliss and while these were wrongly used in the examples quoted they both occur in authentic texts in considering this problem it is well to note the words of the venerable nyana tiloka in the buddhist dictionary one can too often and too emphatically stress the fact that not only the actual realization of the goal of nibbana but also for the theoretical understanding of it it is an indispensable preliminary condition to grasp fully the truth of anatta the egolessness and insubstantiality of all forms of existence 
without certain understanding one will necessarily misconceive nibbana according to one's either materialistic or metaphysical learnings either as an annihilation of an ego or as an external state of existence in which an ego or self enters or with which it merges what this in effect means is that in order to understand nibbana one should have entered the stream or gained first path and thus have got rid of the fetters of personality belief while scholars will continue to see it as part of their task to try to understand what the buddha meant by nibbana they should perhaps have sufficient humility to realize that this is something beyond the range of purely scholarly discussion in the systematization of the abhidhamma nibbana is simply included in the unconditioned element asankat dhatu but with no attempt at definition nibbana is indeed the extinction of the three fires of greed hatred and delusion or the destruction of the corruptions asrava of sense desire becoming wrong view and ignorance since the individual self entity is not ultimately real it cannot be said to be inhilated in nibbana but the illusion of such a self is destroyed very oddly in the pali english dictionary it is said that the nibbana is purely and simply an ethical state it is therefore not transcendental in fact it is precisely the one and only transcendental element in buddhism for which very reason no attempt is made to define it in terms of a personal god a higher self or the like it is ineffable it can however be realized and its realization is the aim of the buddhist practice while no description is possible positive references to the nibbana are not lacking thus at dhammapada 204 and elsewhere it is called the highest bliss paramam sukham and we may conclude this brief account with the famous quotes from the udana there is monks an unborn unbecome unmade uncompounded ajatam abhutam akatam asankatam if there were not this unborn then there would be no deliverance here visible from that which is born become made compounded but since there is unborn and become unmade uncompounded therefore a deliverance is visible from that which is born become made compounded this is the same time perhaps the best answer we can give concerning the upanishadic atman Buddhism teaches no such thing nevertheless a bow quotation would be certainly be applied to the atman as understood in vedanta or indeed to the christian conception of god however to the followers of those faiths it would be an insufficient description and the additions they would make would for the most part be unacceptable to buddhists it can however be suggested that this statement represent the fundamental basis of all religions worthy of the name as well as providing criterion to distinguish true religion from such surrogates as marxism humanism and the like the three marks tilakkana the formula of the three marks also referred to as sign of being is found in many places in expanded versified from dhammapada 277 to 279 it runs all sankharas compounded things are impermanent sabbe sankara anicca all sankharas are unsatisfactory sabbe sankara dukkha all dhammas all things including the unconditioned are without self sabbe dhamma anatta The first and second of these marks apply to all mundane things everything that exists sankara in its widest sense the third refers in addition to the unconditioned element a sankat that is not sankara thus nibbana this doesn't exist relatively but is thus nothing lasts forever all things being subject to change and disappearance 
नथिंग इज कम्प्लीटली सेटिस्फैक्ट्री दुख कन्वेंशनल वेंडेड सफरिंग हैज द वाइड मीनिंग ऑफ नॉट सेटिस्फाइंग फ्रस्ट्रेटिंग पेनफुल इन वाट एवर डिग्री इवन प्लेसेंट थिंग्स कम टू एंड एंड ओ सीज टू अट्रैक्ट एंड द पेनफुल एस्पेक्ट ऑफ लाइफ इज टू वेल नोन एंड ओबिक्यूटस टू नीड डिस्कशन द फर्स्ट टू मार्क्स कैन परहैप्स बी अप्रिशिएटेड विदाउट टू मच एफर्ट इवन दो दर प्रोफाउंड पेनाट्रेशन इज मोर डिफिकल्ट इट इज द थर्ड मार्क दैट हैज प्रोवोक्ड मच कंट्रोवर्सी एंड मिसअंडरस्टैंडिंग अनाथ इन संस्कृत अनात्म इज नेगेटिव ऑफ आत्म ओ आत्मन विच इज सेल्फ सो मच इज क्लियर इन ओडर यूसेज आत इज अ प्रोनाउन यूज फॉर ओल्ड पर्सन एंड जेंडर्स सिंग्यूल एंड प्रोरल मीनिंग माई सेल्फ हर सेल्फ आवर सेल्फ देम सेल्फ एक्सेट्रा इट हैज नो मेटाफिजिकल इम्प्लीकेशन वॉट्सो एवर this then is a self of daily life which has a purely relative and conventional reality if only because it is an almost indispensable expression in everyday speech as a noun atta to the buddhist means an imaginary entity a so called self which is not really there the five khandas or aggregates the various parts that make up our empirical personality do not constitute a self either individually or collectively our so called self then is something bogus it is however a concept that we cling to with great tenacity it was said earlier that any theory that the buddha taught such a doctrine as a upanishadic higher self can only be said to fly in the face of the evidence this is borne out by the third mark all dhammas are without self the term dhamma here includes nibbana the buddhist ultimate thus this is expressly stated not to be any kind of higher self there are those who believe that what buddha taught and what upanishads taught must agree be that as it may at some deep level the expression is certainly different it is arguable that the buddha considered the term self which is to him was something evanescent to be ludicrously inappropriate to the supreme reality whatever its nature to pursue such arguments as this any further is surely fruitless levels of truth an important and often overlooked aspect of the buddhist teaching concerns the level of truth fairly to appropriate which has led to many errors Very often the Buddha talks in the sutta in terms of convention or relative truth sammuti o vohara satya according to which people and things exist just as they appear to have native understanding elsewhere however when addressing an audience capable of appreciating his meaning he speaks in terms of ultimate truth paramatta satya according to which existence is mere process of physical and mental phenomena within which or beyond which no real ego entity no any abiding substance can ever be found buddhist dictionary under paramatta in the abhidhamma the entire exposition is in terms of ultimate truth it may also be observed that many zen paradoxes and the like really owe their puzzling character to their being put in terms of ultimate not of relative truth the full understanding of ultimate truth can of course only be gained by profound insight but it is possible to become increasingly aware of the distinction that would seems in fact to be close parallel in modern times in the difference between our native world view and that of physicist both points of view having their use in their own sphere thus conventionally speaking or according to the naive world view there are solid objects such as tables and chairs whereas according to physics the alleged solidity is seen to be an illusion and whatever might turn out to be ultimate nature of matter it is certainly something very different from that which present itself to our senses however 
when the physicist is off duty he or she makes use of solid tables and charts just like everyone else in the same way all such expressions i self and so on are always in accordance with conventional truth and the buddha never hesitated to use the word at or self and also with plural meaning yourselves etc in its conventional and convenient sense in fact despite all that has been urged to the contrary there is not that slightest evidence that he ever used it in any other sense except when critically quoting the views of others as should clearly emerge from several of suttas here translated in point of fact it should be stressed that conventional truth is sometimes extremely important the whole doctrine of karma and rebirth has its validity only in the realm of conventional truth this is why by liberating ourselves from the viewpoint of conventional truth we cease to be subject to karmic law objections to the idea of rebirth in buddhism too are sometimes based on misunderstanding of the nature of the two truths as long as we are unenlightened worldlings our minds habitually operates in terms of me and mine even if in theory we know better it is not until this tendency has been completely eradicated that full enlightenment can dawn at samyutta nikaya the venerable kemaka who is non returner explains how the subtle remnant of the i conceit of the i desire an unexpected lurking tendency to think i am still persists even at the advanced stage probably the best account of the buddha's attitude to truth is given by the jayatilaka in the early buddhist theory of knowledge it may mention that for those who find this work hard going his second posthumous book the message of the buddha makes for easier reading Jayatilaka has seen attacked for equating the philosophy of Buddhism too closely with the modern school of logical positivism. In this connection, it is perhaps best to let him speak for himself. The Buddha again was the earliest thinker in history to recognize the fact that language tend to distort in certain respect the nature of reality and to stress the importance of not being misled by linguistic forms and conventions in this respect he foreshadowed the modern linguistic or analytical philosophers the message of the buddha it seems hard to find any fault with that jayatilaka goes on he was the first to distinguish meaningless questions and assertions from meaningful ones as in science he recognized perception and interference as the twin souls of knowledge but there was one difference for perception according to buddhism include extra sensory forms as well such as telepathy and clairvoyance science cannot ignore such phenomena and today there are soviet as well as western scientists who have admitted the validity of extra sensory perception in the light of experimental evidence probably most readers will concede the possibility that the buddha knew a few things which modern science is only now beginning to discover or accept we will leave it at that karma the sanskrit form of this word karma is more familiar to the westerners but as its meaning in non buddhist context is not necessarily always the same as in buddhism there is some advantage in using the pali form karma here the literal meaning of the word is action and at anguttara nikaya the buddha defined it as volition chaitana it is therefore any deliberate act good or bad in pali kusala skillful wholesome or akusala unskillful unwholesome a good act will normally lead to pleasant results for the doer and a bad act to unpleasant ones the correct pali and sanskrit word for such result is vipaka ripening though karma or kamma tends in practice to be used loosely for the result as well as the deeds that produce them 
even sometimes by those who really know better. But it is as well to aware of the correct distinction. The question is sometimes asked whether there is free will in Buddhism. The answer should be clear. Each karmic act is the exercise of the choice, good or bad. Thus, though our actions are limited by conditions, they are not totally determined. In this computerized age, it may be helpful to some to think of karma as programming our future. Thus, the karmic formation, sankharas mentioned below are the program which we have, through ignorance, made in past lives. The aim of the practice, of course, is to get beyond all karma. An account of how to progress towards this aim is given in many suttas, and especially in the first division of the Dignikaya. The Twelve Links of the Chain of Dependent Origination This famous formulation is found in many places in the canon and is also represented visually in Tibetan Thangkas in the form of twelve spoked wheel. The Pali term Patiche Samupada is usually rendered dependent origination, though Edward Cohn's preferred conditioned co production. It has been much debated by Western scholars, some of whom produce some strange theories on the subject. The usual formation is as follows Ignorance conditioned the karma formation Avidya Pacha Sankara. The karma formation conditioned consciousness Sankara Pacha Vijnana. Consciousness conditions mind and body, name and form, vijnana pacha nama rupa. Mind and body conditions the six sense bases, nama rupa pacha salayatana. The six sense base condition contact, salayatana pasya paso. Contact conditions feeling, pasya pacha vedana. Feeling conditions craving, vedana pacha tanha. Craving conditions clinging, tanha pachya upadana. Clinging conditions becoming, upadana pachya bhavo. Becoming conditions birth, bhava pachya jati. Birth conditions aging and death, jati pachya jara marna. This is best understood if taken in reverse order. In Sutta 15, the Buddha says to Ananda, If you are asked, has aging and death a condition for its existence? You should answer yes. If asked, what conditions aging and death? You should answer, aging and death is conditioned by birth, and so on. Thus, if there were no birth, there could be no aging and death. Birth is a necessary condition for their arising. According to usual view, which is certainly correct but perhaps not the only way of regarding the matter, the twelve links, Nidanas are spread over three lives, one to two belonging to past life, three to ten is this present life, and eleven to twelve to a future life. Thus the development of four karma formations or behavior patterns is due to past ignorance, that is the fact that we are not enlightened. These patterns condition the rising of new consciousness in the womb, on the basis of which a new psychophysical complex, Nama Rupa, comes into being, equipped with six senses phases of sight, hearing, smelling, tasting and touching, with mind as the sixth sense. Contact of any of these with sense object, sight, sound, etc., produce feeling, which may be pleasant, unpleasant or neutral. On the basis of pleasant feeling, desire or craving arises. The link from consciousness to feeling are the result of fast action, vipaka, whereas craving, clinging and the process of becoming are volitional, that is come, and will therefore have result for the future. In fact, they sit in train the same process of rebirth due to ignorance that we witnessed before and birth must inevitably lead to death. This is the continuous process in which we, as unenlightened beings, are caught up. Curiously, in the Dignikaya, we don't find the twelve links. The steps from feeling to aging and death are mentioned in Sutta 1. While in the two main expositions in this book, the process in reverse is traced back only to its starting point in this life, 
that is, to consciousness and mind and body, which are said to condition each other mutually. Thus, in Sutta 14, we have a set of 10 steps instead of usual 12, while in Sutta 15, still more remarkably, the six senses bases are omitted, thus making a total of only nine links. In other parts of the canon, there are occasional expansions beyond the 12 links give here. But this is the standard formula. It seems that the repeated Barnakas of the Deegh Nikaya had a tradition of their own to which they firmly adhered. While we should certainly not make Ananda's mistake, Sutta 15 verse 1, of thinking the whole thing easy to understand, we can get some general graphs of it, especially if we regard the links in reverse order, which is the way the Buddha explained it to Ananda. At least we shall find that it is not so arbitrary or nonsensical of some Western scholars have supposed. Free birth. There are some people in the West who are attracted in many ways to Buddhism but who find the idea of rebirth a stumbling block either because they find it distasteful or incredible in itself or in some cases because they find it hard to reconcile with non-self idea. Some such considerations as any of these sometimes even lead to people to declare that the Buddha did not actually teach rebirth at all or that if he did so, this was only for popular consumption because his hearers could not have accepted the truth. All such views are based on various kinds of misunderstanding. It should be noted, incidentally, the Buddhists prefer to speak not for reincarnation but of rebirth. Reincarnation is the doctrine that there is a transmigrating the soul or spirit that passes on from life to life. In the Buddhist view, we may say, to begin with, that merely what appears to happen, though in reality no such soul or spirit, passes on in this way. In Majjhima Nikaya 38, the monk Sati was severely reworked for declaring that this very consciousness transmigrates, whereas in reality a new consciousness arises at rebirth dependent on the old. Nevertheless, there is an illusion of continuity in much of the same way as there is within this life. Rebirth from life to life is in principle scarcely different from the rebirth from moment to moment that goes on this life. The point can be intellectually grasped with the greater or less degree of difficulty but it is only at the first path moment. With the penetration of the superior nature of what we call self that is clearly understood without a shadow of doubt remaining, it cannot be the purpose of this book to argue in favor of a belief in rebirth, but skeptics might do well to read rebirth as doctrine and experienced by Francis Story, Buddhist Publication Society 1975, which has an introduction by Ian Stevenson. Charles and Professor of Psychiatry in the University of Virginia. This book contains some cases raised from Thailand and elsewhere which are difficult to explain, except on the rebirth hypothesis, and Professor Stevenson too has published several volumes of research findings of a similar nature from various parts of the world. It may be that the excessive credulity which characterized some previous ages has in the present time given way to equally excessive skepticism. Cosmology If we even provisionally accept the idea of rebirth, this almost necessarily requires acceptance of some kind of spirit world or worlds. In the Buddhist scriptures, we find a scheme of force mortem world which, while having much in common with general Indian ideas, is in many of its details unique. Here there are no eternal heavens or hells, though some of both are said to be tremendously long-lasting, but all is in an external flux in which worlds and the world systems are born and perish, and living beings are continually born, die and are reborn according to their karmic deserts. It is grandiose but ultimately frightening and horrifying vision. Deliverance from it 
is only possible though the insight engaged by following the path taught by one of the Buddhas, who occasionally arises on the scene. For those who fail to gain this insight, there can be a happy rebirth for a long time in one of the temporary heaven worlds, but no permanent deliverance from the perils of birth and death. This is Zansara or cycle of existence, the unfairing. All existence in the various realms of samsara is in one of the three worlds. The world of sense desire, karma loka, the world of form, or the fine material world, rupa loka, and the formless or immaterial world, arupa loka, the latter two of which are inhabited by those who have attained in this life the corresponding mental absorption charnas frequently described in the text. Beyond all these lies the realm of the supramundane Lokutra or Nibbana. The other show the only secure heaven, and this though it can be experienced cannot be described. There are 31 states in which it is said one can be reborn, distributed over three worlds. The lowest of the three, the world of sent desires, consists of first 11 states, of which human rebirth is the fifth. Below, this is the fourfold state of Wu, hence the world of Azuras sometimes rendered titans, of hungry ghosts, faiths, and of animals, while above it are the six lowest heavens. Above these are the sixteen heavens of world of form, and above these again the four heavens of the formless world. Special importance attached to the human condition since it is next to the impossible to gain enlightenment of any other sphere than this. The realm below the human are too miserable and those above it too happy and carefree for the necessary effort to be easily made. The list as it stands shows signs of late elaboration, but many of the spheres shown on their inhabitants are mentioned in the suttas of this collection. The 31 abodes the formless world or arupa loka. 31. Sphere of neither perception nor non perception devas of. Neva sanya na sanya yetanupaga deva. 30. Sphere of nothingness devas of. Akin sanya yetanupaga deva. 29. Sphere of infinity of consciousness devas of. Vinyanan Chayatanupaga Deva. 28. Sphere of Infinity of Space Devas of. Akin Sanyayatanupaga Deva. 27. Fearless Devas. Akanita Deva. 26. Clear Sighted Devas. Sudasti Deva. 25. Beautiful or Clearly Visible Devas. Sudasta Deva. 24. Untroubled Devas. Atapa Deva. 23. Devas not falling away. Aviha Deva. 22. Unconscious beings. Asanya Satta. 21. Very fruitful Devas. Vehapala Deva. 20. Devas of refulgent glory. Subakina Deva. 19. Devas of unbounded glory. Appamana Subadeva. 18. Devas of limited glory, Paritya Subhadeva. 17. Devas of streaming radiance, Abhastar Deva. 16. Devas of unbounded radiance, Appamana Bhadeva. 15. Devas of limited radiance, Paritya Bhadeva. 14. Great Brahmas, Maha Brahma. 13. Ministers of Brahma, Brahma Purohita Deva. 12. Retune of Brahma, Brahma Parasajya Deva. The world of sense desires, O Karma Loka. 11. Devas wielding power over others' creations, Paranimita Vasavati Deva. 10. Devas delighting in creation, Nimman Rati Deva. 9. Contended Devas, Susita Deva. 8. Yama Devas. 7. The 33 Gods. Tavatisma Deva, 6 Devas of 4 Great Kings, Chatur Maharajika Deva, 5 The Human World, 
which is Manusaloka, four the animal world, Tirachina Yoni, three the world of hungry ghost, Petaloka, the Azurus Titans, and Hells, which is Nirea. Explanation of 31 abodes The world of sense desires. Number 1 Hells. The hell stages are often rendered purgatory to indicate that they are not eternal. Description of the hells, their horrors and the length of time supposedly spent there became increasingly lurid as time went on. In the Dig Nikaya, there are no such descriptions. The kind of duration of suffering in such state of woe being left quite vogue. Jayatilaka quotes from the Samyutta Nikaya. Open quote. When the average ignorant person makes an assertion that there is a hell under the ocean, he is making a statement that is false and without basis. The word hell is a term for painful bodily sensation. Close quote. This certainly deserves more credence as saying of the Buddha than the late Suttas Majjhima Nikaya 192 and 193. See also Visuddhi Magga for more on these first four abodes. Number two, Asuras. Rebirth among the Asuras or Titans is sometimes omitted from the list of separate destinations. In the Mahayan tradition, they are often regarded more favorably than in the Pali Canon. Perhaps, Reminiscence of their earlier status as goats. Number 3. Hungry Goats These unhappy creatures are deplicated with enormous bellies and tiny mouths. They wander about the world in great distress, which can, however, be elevated by generous offerings. The Petavattu, the seventh book of Kuddhika Nikaya, and one of the last portion of the canon has many strange tales about them. Number 4. Animal World The animal kingdom, together with the human realm, constitutes the only realm of beings normally visible to human sight and therefore indisputably existing. Aditya Kesak humbly, like any modern rationalist, disbelieved in all the rest. There are those today in the West who object strongly to the idea that the Buddha taught that we can be reborn as animals, though at first sight the evidence is all against them. However, since Tirachana, normally meaning animal, is used in Sutta 1, in the compounds Tirachina Kata, Tirachina Vija, meaning Loto, Bezat, it is just possible that as a destination for human, Tirachana Yoni can be taken as a low rebirth. Some confirmation is provided by the case of Korokatya Sutta. Number 5. The Human World Rebirth as a human being is regarded as a great opportunity which should be seized since it may not easily recur and it is almost impossible to enter the stream and so start on the path to Nibbana from any other condition. Being in the state below the human are too miserable, fearful and benighted and those above it are too happy to make the necessary effort. In the human world we encounter both joy and sorrow, often very evenly balanced and it is also possible to attain to a state of equanimity which is favorable to progress. Nevertheless, most human beings are very much under the sway of sense desires as indeed are the inhabitants of the world immediately above this one. Number 6 realm of four great kings. These kings are the guardians of the four quarters and a lively account of existence on their plane is given in Sutta 20, to which reference should be made. The beings from here are on called Devas or in some cases alternatively Brahmas, various kinds of non-human beings, not all of whom are beneficent, are supposed to be located in or associated with this realm and are mentioned in Sutta 20. Since the inhabitants of this sphere, especially the Gandhabas, heavenly musicians and attendants of the kings and their followers, are still addicted to sense pleasures, it is considered 
disgracefully for a monk to be reborn there. However, as we are told in Sutta 21, verses 11, it is possible for such a progress to a much higher plane if they make the effort. Number 7. The 33 Gods Their heaven had once been the abode of Azuras who had been expelled from it. No list of the 33 exists, but their chief is Sakra, Sanskrit Sakra, who is either reformed Indra or, as Rhys Davids considered, a Buddhist replacement for him. Many good people were reborn in their realm. Number 8. Yama Devas These Devas are usually only mentioned in passing. The name is said to mean those who have attained to divine bliss, but may also relate to Yama, king of the dead. Number 9. Contended Devas and It is their heaven that Bodhisattvas reside before their last birth and once returners are also sometimes born there. Number 10 and 11. Devas delighting in creation. Devas wielding power over others' creations. The former can create any shape they like, the latter delight in things created by others, to get them in their powers. These two are the highest in the worlds of sense desires. The world of form, fine material world. Number 12. The retinue of Brahma. The inhabitants of abodes 12 to 21 are known as Devas or Brahmas. Rebirth in this world is dependent on experience of lower jhanas as well as normal behavior. Those who live in them are free from sensual desire, though in most cases only by suppression through the jhanas, not by eradication. 13 to 14 Ministers of Brahma and Great Brahmas. 15 to 21 these are all words in which those who have experienced the low vajanas may be reborn according to their development. Thus the highest sphere, number 21, is inhabited by those who have had a strong experience of the fourth jhana and so on downwards. Number 22, unconscious beings. Number 23 to 27, these are pure abodes in which non-returners are reborn and whence they gain Nibbana without returning to earth. The formless world, immaterial world. Number 28 to 31. These compound to the four higher jhanas of the formless world and rebirth in these realms depend on the attainment of these jhanas. As for numbers 12 to 21. Gautama attained the sphere of nothingness under his first teacher, and to the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception under his second teacher Uddhika Ramaputta, he thus reached the highest state of attainable without breaking through to the supramundane, which is Lokuttara, which has beyond the three worlds. Some names and designations Brahma. In Buddhism there is not one Brahma or a great Brahma but many and they are not immortal. The origin of the belief in Brahma as the creator of the world is given in Sutta 1. And a satirical picture of the boastful great Brahma, who nevertheless is a true follower of the Buddha, is given in Sutta 11. But though not almighty or eternal, Brahmas are powerful and benevolent beings who are still believed in Oriental Buddhist countries to be able to bestow mundane favors. For one example, the Brahma shrine outside the Eastern Hotel in Bangkok. One great Brahma, Sahampati, begged the newly enlightened Buddha to teach those who had little dust on their eyes. There is no certain or even probable trace of a new Brahman in Pali scriptures. In Sutta 13, two young Brahmin consult the Buddha on how to attain to union with Brahma or more correctly, Fellowship with Brahma. Rhys David has been accused of mistranslating Sahavatya here as union, thus implying a mystical union rather than merely belonging to the company of Brahma. But the Brahmins had explained to the Buddha that they were puzzled because different teachers interpreted the path to Brahma in different ways. Thus, both interpretations may well be implied here. Buddha. This is, of course, a generic term, not a proper name. Gautama was the Buddha, not just Buddha. The same should apply to Christ, 
the anointed but usage is against this it is a past participle form meaning awakened thus enlightened buddhas appear at vast intervals of time beside the fully enlightened buddha who teaches dhamma to the world samasam buddha there is a private buddha which is pacheka buddha who is enlightened but doesn't teach as time went on a more and more elaborate buddhology developed the first beginning of which can be seen here in sutta 14 it was under the buddha dipankara vast years ago that the brahmin so made the first made the determination to become a buddha which he finally did as a historical buddha gotama see especially sutta 14 deva this world is difficult to translate and in general i have retained the pali form though in case of the 33 gods I have called them such since they constitute something of a pantheon like that found in ancient Greece and elsewhere even though few of them are individually named as will be seen from the table the term deva is applied to the inhabitant of all or any of the states above the human though those in the world of form can also called brahma a term which is probably better restricted to the inhabitants of well number 14 the etymological meaning of deva is bright shining but the world is popularly associated with the root dew to play devas are said to be of three kinds conventional that is kings and princes who are addressed as deva hence the indian idea of the god king a title adopted by the kings of cambodia but misapplied in modern times to the dalai lama number 2 purified that is buddha and arahants and number 3 spontaneously born upati deva that is devas in the sense as used here beside the form deva which is uncommon in third sense in the singular we find the abstract noun devata used much of like deity in english It should be noted that though this noun is grammatically feminine it does not necessarily imply female sex when it is wished to indicate the sex the word devata putta deva san and devadita devas dot may be used though as most devas are spontaneously reborn this should not be taken literally however there are some indications of sexual reproduction occurring in the lower heavens we learn from sutta 20 and 22 that the gandabha chief timbaru had a daughter they must have all been human and may be reborn again in human world which in fact would be good fortune for them as it is so much easier to gain enlightenment from the human state in which of their former human state it has been suggested that they are not unlike spirits another suggested translation is angels but on the whole it seemed best with one slight exemption noted to retain the pali term for these beings gandabhas celestial musicians subject to dhatavata the great king of the east they act as attendants on the devas and are still much addicted to sense pleasures it was formerly thought that gandabhas also presided at conception but this is due to misunderstanding of passage in majjhima nikaya 38 where it is stated that the gandabha must be present in addition to a man and a woman for conception to take place the word here means as commentaries explain being about to be born there is new consciousness arise independent on that of a being who has died garudas there were giant birds ever at war with the nagas except when under the buddha's influence a truce is called so the 20 the garuda is a royal badge of thailand in indian legend vishnu rode on a garuda nagas the most interesting and difficult of the various classes of non-human beings basically the term seems to apply to snakes in particular the king cobra the nagas are also associated with elephants 
probably on account of snake like trunk they are very wise and powerful though they suffer terribly from these attacks of the garunas the term is often used for a great man including the buddha but as malasekar writes in the accounts given in the nagas there is undoubtedly great confusion between nagas as supernatural beings as snakes and as name of certain non aryan tribes but the confusion is too difficult to unravel tathagata the word generally used by the buddha in referring to himself or to the other buddhas though it is seemingly can apply to any arahant etymologically it means e the tathagata thus come or tathagata thus gone it would seem to be way of indicating that he who stands before you is not like other beings for commentarial explanations see big bodhis separate translation of sutta 1 the dig commentaries gives no fewer than eight different explanations and the mahayana schools have many more yakas yakas who are subject to vasavana great king of the north are curiously ambivalent creatures for reasons explained in sutta 32 Some are believers in the Buddha but others not wishing to keep the precepts are hostile to the Dhamma and they are in fact in the majority. I mean the good yakas however we find in Sutta 19 Janavasabha who had been king Bimbisara of Magadha and the stream winner. Later tradition insists more and more on the bad side of the yakas who come to be regarded as ogres or demons pure and simple. with the female of species being more deadly than the male the pali canon according to tradition the text of pali canon was settled at a council held at rajagaha immediately after the teacher's passing having been memorized by leading elders who were highly realized practitioners of the dhamma in fact it is clear that the collection as we it originate over a longer period the canon was preserved in oral form until the 1st century bc when it became apparent that the scarce text might vanish from the earth if they were not recorded in writing they were accordingly written down under king watagamini at this time in sri lanka the some portions may already have been committed to writing earlier the feat of memory involved in preserving such an extensive body of text orally for so long may seem extraordinary to us but was quite usual in ancient india writing was certainly known in india in buddha's time but was not used for such purpose it must however be remembered that in the course of 45 years of the buddha's preached doubtless often in standardized form to many thousands of people and that many of the monks and nuns had trained minds and memories and will have known full well the meaning of what they were repeating from about time of second council it had been sadly a century after the buddha's passing we hear of division and the formation of sects within the order this led eventually to rise of mahayana schools an up to date account of these developments can be found in ak vodas indian buddhism Here we need merely note that the Theravada type of Buddhism was carried early to Ceylon and later to Burma, Thailand and other parts of Southeast Asia. Whereas the forms of Buddhism that spread to Tibet, China, Japan and some more northerly regions were of the developed Mahayana type. Portions of the early scriptures of some of the schools that arose have been preserved either in Sanskrit or very often in chinese and otibitian translation the sanskrit of these texts is often very bad but the attempt was clearly made to lend dignity to the teaching by using the classical language we thus find that buddhist terms are found in both pali and sanskrit forms and while the pali terms are doubtless older the sanskrit forms are sometimes better known to the western reader The Sanskrit kamma is more often used by westerners than Pali kamma Sanskrit dharma and nirvana than Pali dhamma and nibbana
the Pali language. Strictly speaking, the word Pali means text, but the expressions Pali Bhasa meaning language of the text was early taken to be the name of the language itself. Its use is practically confined to Buddhist subjects and then only in the Theravada school. Its exact origins are the subject of learned debate. While we cannot go too deeply into the matter here, it may be said that the traditional equation with the language of the ancient kingdom of Magadha and the assertion that Pali is literally and precisely the language spoken by Buddha himself cannot be sustained. All the same, the language the Buddha actually spoke was in all probability not very different from Pali. From the point of view of non-specialist, we can think of Pali as a kind of simplified Sanskrit. Its development, like that of other early Indian dialects, can be true of the similar to an early form of Italian just breaking away from Latin. A close parallel is found in the word of the seven where Latin septum has become Italian sette. The Sanskrit equivalent sapta is in Pali satta, and similar types of simplification are found in hundreds of words. The grammar too has been slightly simplified, though not nearly so much as that of Italian. But the two languages are still so close that it is possible to convert whole passages of Sanskrit into Pali simply by making necessary mechanical transpositions. This translation, the text on which this translation is based, is the Pali Text Society edition by T. W. Rees Davids and J. E. Carpenter, three volumes, 1890 to 1910. I have made some slight use of the Thai translation as well as of Frankie's German one and have also made a few corrections following the Venerable Buddha Datta, Nyanamoli and others as indicated at the appropriate places. It must be pointed out that any translation of Parnikan is faced with pe peculiar difficulties if only owing to the repetitiveness of the originals. Even the manuscripts contain numerous abridgments, and any translators must necessarily abridge a great deal more. I have dealt with repetitions in three ways. Long sections have been condensed into few lines, which appears in italics and includes the sutta and verses numbers of the omitted passages. Where it is clear from the context what is being omitted, I have simply used ellipses. Where it is not clear, I have used ellipses as well as sutta and verse numbers. In doing so, I have ensured that nothing of substance has been omitted. I have made no exigence of account of real or alleged lateness or inauthenticity or like. Such matters are left to the reader's judgment with an occasional note for guidance. I have as far as possible avoided the use of masculine nouns and pronouns where both sexes are implied. I have, however, always been guided by my understanding of the text, bearing in mind the many admonitions addressed specifically to monks, as well as the word of Brahmins and others who were undoubtedly sexist. I have also kept masculine gender in a few cases where to do otherwise would have produced intolerable awkwardness or inverse spoiled scansion. I have tried to convey as much as possible the style of original, rendering it to an English which is, I hope, neither too archaic nor too hypermodern. I have permitted myself a few syntactic abridgment phrases like Bhagavata, Saddim, Samodhi, Samodhaniyam, Katam, Saraniyam, Vitisaratva, which Rhys David renders he exchanged with the Blessed One the greeting and compliments of politeness and curiosity have been cut down, in this case to exchange courtesies with him. As regards the designation Bhagava, I have used the Lord in narration, varied occasionally in quoted speech with the Blessed Lord. Other translators have the Blessed One, the Exalted One and so on. The repetitions in the canon have probably two distinct sources. It is extremely likely that the Buddha himself developed a standard form for sermons, which is doubtless 
uttered verbatim O oh, nearly so many thousands of times during his 45 years ministry. He would seem to have gone on the principle which many teachers use and recommend to his day. First tell them what you are going to say, then say it, then tell them what you have said. His disciples will then have extended his principle into a system of rigidly stereotyped phrases. The second source of repression will have been in heightened in the oral tradition itself, as it witnessed by oral literature all over the world. This is always characterized by long repetitive passages and stereotyped epithets and descriptions. This tendency will in the present instance have been reinforced by the wish to preserve the master's word as accurately as possible. It should also be remembered that it was not all a mere matter of mechanical repetition the authenticity of the Pali Canon. Certainly, not all parts of Pali Canon are equally old or can be literally taken to be the Buddha's precise words. This is plain common sense and does not mean completely rejecting their authenticity. Recent searches have gone far to vindicate the claim that the Pali Canon holds at least a prime place among our sources in the search for original Buddhism or in fact what the Buddha taught. No attempt can be made here to go into any detail concerning questions of authenticity or of the chronological satisfaction of the materials found in the Dignikaya. Some indications of scholarly opinion on this subject can be found, especially in Pande, studies in the origins of Buddhism in 1967, though not all his findings are equally acceptable. Personally, I believe that all or almost all doctrinal statements put directly into the mouth of the Buddha can be accepted as authentic and this seems to me the most important point. An individual aid to the understanding of Pali Canon is provided by the old commentaries Attakatha. These need to be used with caution and they certainly contain numerous fierce fabrications. Without them, however, our understanding of the suttas would be woefully deficient. The two chief commentaries have been published in Pali by the Pali Text Society. The earliest is called Sumangala Vilasini, a vigilance of great blessing, but is usually known more prosaically as the Diganikaya commentary. Diganikaya Takata. This is by the great Buddha Gosa who lived in the 5th century CE. The second or sub-commentary Tika called Diganikaya Takata Tika Linatta Vanana Explanation of Obscurities in the Diganikaya Commentary or DAT for short is a commentary on the commentary. Extensive extracts from these two commentaries in Sutta 1 and 15 are given by Bhikkhu Bodhi in separate translation of those suttas and similar extracts are given by Somathera in his version of Sutta 22. Some scanty comments are also quoted by Rhys Davis at intervals. I have added few more extracts in my notes where it seemed necessary, besides occasionally clarifying or correcting Rhys Davis's notes. Buddha Goza was an Indian scholar monk of amazing erudition who spent many years in Sri Lanka where he wrote The Path of Purification, Visit the Mug, a comprehensive guide to doctrine and meditation splendidly translated into English by the Venerable Jnana Moli and published by the Buddhist Publication Society, Sri Lanka, 1956. His version is great improvement on the old one published by the Pali Text Society as the path of purity. It appears that all commentaries on the Pali Canon, some of which seems to have been very ancient, were translated into Sinhalese and the Pali originals lost and that Buddha Guru made from these a new Pali version. In general, it is clear that he is recording traditional opinions and interpretations holding back, except on rare occasions, from expressing a personal opinion with admirable self-effacement. It is to be expected that in due course the major commentaries will be translated into English from their rather difficult late Pali language. The Divisions of the Pali Canon The Pali Canon is divided into three main sections, the three baskets, 
number one Vinayapitaka. This deals with the monastic discipline for monks and nuns. Number two Sutta Pitaka. The discourses, the portion of the canon of most interest to lay Buddhists. Number three Abhidhamma Pitaka. The further doctrine, a highly schematized philosophical compendium in seven books, most of which have now been translated into English by the PTS. The Sutta Pitaka consists of five collections, Nikayas. The present translation is a new version of the first of these. Number one, Diga Nikaya, the long collection. Number two, Majjhima Nikaya, the medium collection, the teaching of the Buddha. Number three, Samyutta Nikaya, collection of groups, according to subject matter. Number four, Anguttara Nikaya, collection of expanding groups, single things, twos, threes, and so on, up to elevens. Number five, Kuddhika Nikaya, the lesser collection, a heterogeneous collection in 15 divisions of very varying interest to the modern reader. The first book of the Kuddhika Nikaya is Kuddhika Pata, the minor text used as a Nivois handbook. Number two, Dhammapada, verses on Dhamma, one of the most famous of Buddhist scriptures and anthology in 26 chapters and 423 stanzas. Number three, Udana, Solm Aternus. Number four, Itivuttaka, thus it was said. Number five, Sutta Nipata. Number six, Vimanavattu, stories of the heavenly mansions. Number seven, Petavattu, stories of the departed or of hungry ghosts. Number eight, Theragatha, songs of the male elders. And number nine, Therigatha, songs of the female elders. Number ten, Jataka, birth stories, tales of former lives of the Buddha, much used as a parables, otherwise mainly of interest of folklore. Number 11, Nidhesa, expositions, an old commentary ascribed to Sariputta. Number 12, Patisambhita Mag, path of discrimination. Number 13, Apadana, tradition, tales of Arhans similar to Jataka. Number 14, Buddha Vamsa, Chronicles of Buddhas. Number 15, Charyapitaka, Basket of Conduct.